Well, good morning, and it is a joy to welcome you here today to the campus of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary on a day of great uh, anticipation and also a day of great celebration as well. Uh, I am uh, extremely proud of these graduates, uh, the hard work that they have put in to arrive at this day. And as was prayed earlier, uh, we grieve to see them leave, but we recognize they did not come here to stay. Uh, they came here to go. And so we delight in uh, seeing you depart from here and going to the various fields of service uh, that the Lord has for you. As I was praying and thinking about what I could bring today in terms of a challenge, uh, I felt led by the Lord to go to what I call the final marching orders of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Lederbach noted a moment ago that uh, what is called the Great Commission uh, is embedded in our mission statement. Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary seeks to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by equipping students to serve the church and to fulfill the Great Commission. Interestingly, uh, the phrase Great Commission does not appear in the Bible, and yet it accurately captures a number of various texts in the New Testament, but in particular, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Indeed, Great Commission does accurately capture the final marching orders of our Lord. You all know that this was the banner under which you entered Southeastern Seminary, and this will also be the banner under which you graduate. Indeed, the prayer of this faculty is that every one of you, without exception, will be a Great Commission graduate who will spend the rest of your life being a Great Commission Christian. You know, last words by their very nature are intended to be lasting words. They are words that mean a lot to the one uttering those words. And so, as Jesus was preparing to ascend back into heaven, if you want to know what was on his heart, what was on his heart was that we would indeed get the gospel to every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation, and that we would make disciples of all the nations. His mind was clear when he gave this order. After all, he has just risen from the dead. He has completed his work of atonement. He is about to ascend back into heaven. And so with clarity and conviction, he plainly states for us what is to be the mission of the church until he returns, or as he says at the end of verse 20, until the end of the age. And so the Great Commission is the final marching orders of Jesus for the church. The Great Commission is the final marching orders of the Lord Jesus for every single believer. Now, as we think about these words, I want to bring three different aspects to you this morning in terms of a challenge, and indeed what I hope will accompany you all the days of your ministry, wherever it is that the Lord will send you. First of all, as you go, always acknowledge His power. Verse 18 begins, And Jesus came and said to them, to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Four times in these final three verses, you will see some form of the word all. In other words, Matthew is trying to emphasize, indeed, as he cites the words of our Lord, the all comprehensiveness and the universality of his sovereignty and his lordship. He is not lord over some things. He is Lord over everything. He is the sovereign king of creation. He is the sovereign king of the universe. If you read these words in context, you recognize that there's an echo here of Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where this mysterious son of man figure comes to the Ancient of Days and receives what is described as an ever lasting kingdom. We now know in light of the New Testament that it is the Son of God who comes to the Father God and receives a kingdom that will never end. The Father has given to His Son all authority, all power, and absolute sovereignty. I love the way that John Piper puts it, the risen Christ is great. He is greater than you ever imagined. 
Here then is our witness to the world. The risen Christ is your king, and he has absolute unlimited authority over your life. If you do not bow and worship him and trust him and obey him, you commit high treason against your king who is God over all. This king indeed has all power. He has all authority. And the beauty of the Christian life is he delegates that same power and authority to you as you go on his behalf. As we are sent one, sent by the sovereign king, you do not go alone, but you go with him and you go with his power. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, think, I think said it quite well in this context. God's work is done in God's way. It will never lack God's supply. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Acknowledge his power as you go. Secondly, obey his plan. His plan is very clearly laid out in verse 19 and verse 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Of course, you learned in your time here at Southeastern that there's a single imperative in that command, and that command is make disciples. And yet I hope you also learn from your Greek professors that those three participles that are orbiting about that command, make disciples, go, baptize, and teach, receive also the power or the import of a command, an imperative as well. In other words, he commands us to go. Uh, he commands us to baptize. He commands us to teach. And that is the means whereby we are capable of making disciples. In other words, God's call on every minister of the gospel, God's call on every Christian, is that we would indeed make devoted Christ followers who will deny themselves, who will take up their cross, and like us, follow him wherever it is that he may send you. And so here's the bottom line, brothers and sisters. Uh, you don't need to pray about whether or not you should go. That's settled. He has commanded you to go. The simple response on your part is, where, Lord? Where, Lord? And wherever it is that he sends you, wherever it is that he tells you to go, you are indeed to go. Of course, anyone that knows anything about Southeastern Seminary knows that we place a very great interest on going to the nations, going to the tribes and the tongues that are extended around the globe. Why? Well, let me just again update you, and I checked this morning to make sure my data was correct. Even today, with all of our technology, uh, with all of our wealth, uh, with all that we have in the year 2018, there's still more than 7,000 unreached people groups on planet Earth. When you put all that together today, in the year 2018, with all of our technology and with all of our resources, with all of the Christian churches that are scattered around America and around the globe, there's still 3.14 billion people who have either no access to the gospel or very limited access to the gospel. That means around the world today, there are people who've never heard the name of Jesus even one time. Around the world today, there are people who will be born, they will live, they will die, they will go to hell. And they never even one time heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys and gals, I have to believe that's unacceptable to our king. I believe that has to be unacceptable to you and to me as well. But let me say a word to this particular audience this morning. If you're here this uh, morning and you are not a Christian, first of all, let me say we are delighted that you're here. We prayed for you yesterday. Uh, all the graduates and I gathered and we prayed yesterday in particular for those of you that are here today that have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And so let me be very, very clear and I speak, I promise you, from a genuineness of heart that I cannot put into words. There are many people around the globe, as I just said, who've never heard the gospel. That's not true for you. That's not true for you. 
you will not be able to stand before God at the judgment and every one of us will stand before God at judgment and say to him Lord I I never heard no one ever told me that you loved me no one ever told me that you sent your son the Lord Jesus into this world because you love me nobody ever told me that Jesus lived a perfect sinless life teaching and healing and doing miracles nobody ever told me that when he died on the cross he died for me no one ever told me that when he died on the cross he bore in his body your judgment and your wrath in my place nobody ever told me that when he died on the cross he paid in full the penalty of my sin nobody ever told me that you raised him from the dead as a a sign to the world that you accepted his sacrifice no one ever told me if I would repent of my sin and put my faith and trust in Jesus you would save me you will not be able to stand before God and say to him no one ever told me because you've at least heard the gospel today and let me say this to you I know that you're here today to celebrate this wonderful wonderful graduation and that you're here today to celebrate the graduation of a son or a daughter or a grandson a granddaughter a dear friend but let me say to you nothing would bring greater delight to these graduates than to know that today was the day of your salvation and that today you did the most important thing a person will ever do in their entire life and you put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone to save you from your sin John Keith Falconer was a English aristocrat he was a great Arabic scholar at Cambridge a great athlete in fact he was the world cycling champion in 1878 he walked away from his wealth he walked away from his athletic career and he became a missionary to Yemen he would only be there a very short time because at the tender age of 31 he would contract malaria and die he would not be returned to England to be buried but he would be buried in the country that he went to evangelize and share the gospel here's what John Keith Falconer said I have but one candle of life to burn and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light I'd rather burn out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light CT Studd another missionary hero of mine called uh, one of the Cambridge seven a missionary to China a missionary to India a missionary to Africa he would die in Africa in Congo and be buried there in a very simple grave what did uh, CT Studd say some wish to live within the sound of a church bell but I wish to run a rescue mission within one yard of hell that's the kind of graduate that I pray that you will be that's the kind of passion I pray that you will have until the day that the Lord brings you home David Livingston also a wonderful missionary to Africa died on his knees praying for the Africans his heart was taken out of his chest and buried in a uh, underneath the tree there because his heart was in Africa and those who loved him wanted his heart to stay in Africa David Livingston said sympathy is no substitute for action without Christ not one step but with Christ anywhere acknowledge his power obey his plan number three trust in his promise he says at the end of verse 20 and behold I am with you always even to the end of the age who makes this promise King Jesus what is his promise I will be with you how long is his promise always even to the end of the age Hudson Taylor founder of China Inland Mission said God isn't looking for people of great faith but God is looking for individuals who are ready to follow him anywhere he tells them to go and so I want to say to all of you again today wherever it is that the Lord sends you I can make you this promise he goes with you if he sends you to Africa he goes with you if he sends you to Southeast Asia he goes with you 
If he sends you to South America, he goes with you. If he sends you into the inner cities of North America or to a rural location, he is with you every step of the way. George Eldon Ladd was a wonderful New Testament scholar. In commenting on Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, which says, listen, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. One more time. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. In commenting on that verse, George Eldon Ladd said, and I quote, if a relatively small minority of God's people took this text seriously and responded to its challenge, we could finish the task of worldwide evangelization in our own generation. God alone knows the definition of terms. I cannot precisely define who all the nations are. Only God knows the exact meaning of evangelize. He alone will know when that goal is fulfilled. But I do not need to know. I only know one thing. Christ has not yet returned. Therefore, the task is not yet done. When it is done, Christ will come. Our responsibility then is not to insist on defining the terms our responsibility is to complete the task. So long as Christ does not return, our work is undone. Let us then get busy and complete our mission. As you graduate today, my simple prayer for each one of you is simply this, the will of God, nothing less, nothing more, and nothing else. Or as Nicholas von Zinzendorf so well said, I have but one passion, and it is Christ, and it is Christ alone. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your infallible and inerrant word that gives us the final marching orders of King Jesus until the end of the age. And I thank you, Lord, that our mission is clear. Make disciples of all the nations, of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And so, Lord, may we be found faithful and obedient to that assignment until you come again. But, Lord, help us also to remember that that assignment begins at home. It begins with our family. Lord, today there are family members here who are not saved. There are friends who have come to celebrate today because they love one of these graduates and they're not saved. And so, Lord, it is my prayer right now that you would speak to the heart of those who are here who are lost, who've never put their faith and trust in Jesus. And Lord, it is my prayer that right now, at this very moment, they would make that greatest of all decisions, that most important of all decisions, and that they would repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Jesus. Lord, might it be that right now, at this very moment, some of them in their heart would simply voice this prayer to you. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. And I thank you that you proved it by dying on the cross for all of my sins. I am a sinner, and I know that I need to be saved. And I know I cannot save myself. Jesus, I believe you died for me, and I believe that you rose from the dead. Today, I repent and turn from my sin. I put my faith and my trust in you and you alone for my salvation. And Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word teaches that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And Lord, I thank you even now for those that have just prayed that prayer, asking you to come into their life, to be their Lord, to be their Savior, to be their Master, to be their King. And Lord, when this service is over in just a short while, as we're out celebrating in the courtyard, might they walk up to the graduate that they came to honor today. And might they hug their neck, Lord, and, and congratulate them on graduating, but may they also say, by the way, when, when, when Danny prayed that prayer, I prayed that prayer with him. And Jesus saved me today. And I just want you to know that. I, I know, Lord, nothing will bring greater joy to the heart of these graduates than to hear that kind of testimony. Lord, we have a task until you come again. May we be faithful to pursue that task with all that we are and all that we have. We pray this in your sovereign, saving name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.